All right. Hello, everyone. Monday. This is Laura from Enerstructa, and this is our weekly Zero Energy Homes Talk. Thanks for joining me. Today we are going to talk about roofs and insulation specifically. So we over the last couple of weeks we talked about walls and foundations. So now we will talk about roofs. And last week we did talk a little bit about roof insulation, so I will just uh some of that this might be a review, but for those of you who didn't listen to that talk, it'll be new for you. So a lot of homes are built with trusses, so wood manufactured trusses, and they are usually triangle shaped. There's lots of different types of truss designs. We'll just say we have a triangle shaped truss, and there's a, so there's a, I don't think it's my hand, but I can't see it's right out here. There's a bottom cord, and then you have your two, um, Top cords, and then you have the webbing of wood. It's usually two by fours that are in there. So the way they work is the bottom cord of the truss forms your ceiling line in the top floor of your house, and so above that, so that's usually drywall, and then above that you have insulation. Hopefully, especially in new construction, uh, depending on where you are, that's there's different requirements out here. Uh, I, I'm seeing, I can't even remember, I think, uh, yeah, code is R49 for just a flat ceiling versus a uh, vaulted ceiling. So there's different requirements, different areas. Code is, is again a minimum. So um, I feel like it might be 38, but. I don't really see anyone doing 38. I'm seeing 49. I think I'm pretty sure it's 49. Uh, most of the builders I work with are building above code, so I don't really even keep track of what the minimum requirements are uh, because we are trying to build homes that are future future ready, so that our our choices are not going to become obsolete in the next three years when there's a new code cycle. So. Generally, I'm even seeing a lot of houses get R60 insulation, so that is about 18 inches or so of blown-in fiberglass. You can also use blown-in cellulose insulation, So, but generally I see a lot more fiberglass being installed just because it has a little bit more higher R value per inch, and it's just a little bit more common. Cellulose is good if you want more, uh, like, it's because it's made out of like paper product, so it's a little bit more natural, and some people like that better. Um, it can be more susceptible to getting wet and mold issues and that kind of thing, but I mean, generally it's treated, so at least these days, so that should be less of a concern. But generally, in a flat attic, I see R49 or R60 insulation, so good amount of insulation. More is always better. An attic space, especially blown in, is a really easy area to, and cost-effective area to, to add more insulation. So again, before we insulate, I went right into that, but we need to make sure we do our air sealing very, really well so that we're not leaking air through the ceiling and then making our insulation ineffective. So make sure generally the drywall seams get taped in mud and then sometimes I see like a sill gasket getting installed, like along so on the top of the wall, the top, of the top plate where the so there's a there's the double top plate. So I see this foam gasket getting installed against that, and then the ceiling comes and butts up into into that foam, so it helps create a better seal from the attic space. Another way you can do that is to install your drywall and then go on top and do like a blackout method where you have light shining from the floor below up into the attic space and then you seal all of the places where 
the light is shining through. So like where two seams of drywall come together or where the drywall meets the top plate, any of that kind of thing. So you just keep sealing it until you see no daylight or, or artificial light, whatever kind of light source you're using. So yeah, blown in, definitely trusses with blown in insulation is probably one of the most cost effective ways to have a roof. And so if you are building using your top floor as a conditioned attic space, that means you would not likely be using a truss unless it's possibly a parallel cord truss. Then you might have a sort of truss, which is like, it's basically, there's like, it's basically shaped like a triangle, but it has like two cords that are parallel and then webbing in between it. So you Google that and look for an image to see what that looks like. But uh, generally, if you have a vaulted ceiling, you might have that, or you might have eye joists or solid wood, just like two by 12s as your rafter members. So it just kind of depends on preference. I know there's challenges with any sort of uh, a building method. I know with eye joists, sometimes the angles and things can kind of get tricky to detail out and seal well around them. And some people are just more used to traditional framing with two by material. So it just kind of depends what, where you are and what builder you're working with or what your personal preferences are on our house. I'm just going to flip the camera while I talk so you don't have to keep staring at me. <laughs> so on our house, we are doing our top floor with a vaulted ceiling. And we are using 2 by 12 rafters that are connected at the top to a ridge board, not a beam. It's not structural. It's just there to help catch the ends of the rafters. And then we will be having a collar tie up here going across. So that's going to help resist the... Uh, the rafters from wanting to splay out towards the top. We also have, we're going to have the sheathing on the top and then we have a strap ridge over to the other side and that's on top of the sheathing. So that'll help that joint stay together. The rafters are nailed to the ridge board. So that's that connection. And then down here, we just have these temporarily tacked in because we were testing out to see if they so down here, we have these Simpson brackets, and we're going to have one of these on each side. One's going to be here on the side, and one's going to be like this. And then these Simpson screws will also, once we get this in its final place, we will be adding all three of those in these spots as well. So that's going to tie the rafter to the plate. And so that is going to keep the bottom of the rafter from pulling, pushing out. The plate is connected through anchor bolts into the concrete walls. And so that's all going to be tied together. So, so yeah, we had to cut. I'm just going to show you the other side, but this is better. Uh, so we had to cut this bird's mouth cut here, also known as the seat cut, so we had to cut that here so that the rafter could sit through the plate, and then we cut the tail, and made our plumb cut down at the end, and then another plumb cut at the top, so we could get our 10-12 roof pitch, so kind of a steep pitch, but we were initially had thought we would do a 12-12, but we decided to not go that steep. So as we learned, and I mean, we kind of knew already, but hand-built rafters are considerable more amount of work. So, and so just like the labor cost of doing that, if you're doing it yourself, it's something you can do on your own. But Definitely a good amount of uh, of work to get these cut. 
So I think they're really great. I, I did hand cut rafters for my tiny house as well. So I think they're great for maybe smaller structures and you know, it just kind of depends on the need. So we, just because of our design and we wanted to try to do our work without a crane. So we decided to have this system where we are using stick framed rafters and then so with a vaulted ceiling there are a couple of options so on top of once we get the rafters we're gonna or we will have the roof sheathing on top and then from there we're, we're going to be insulating this entire cavity so we can either do that with we can do three inches of close cell foam and then fill the rest with a, a bat insulation or blind insulation, whether that's fiberglass or cellulose or cool properties like being fire resistant and uh, and like managing moisture and um there's oh it's also like insect resistant so there's a lot of cool properties with rock wool insulation it's just like a little bit more environmentally friendly material so we'll see if we decide to have what kind of insulation we're going to put in the cavity the other thing we've been thinking about which is instead of using your foam here you can we can put a whole batch or blown in insulation in the whole space of the rafter and then put exterior insulation on top of the sheeting. So have sheeting and exterior insulation. And what the benefit of that is is that it creates a thermal break so that our rafters are not creating a break between the inside and outside that is more conductive than insulation so that's a whole point purpose of insulation is to help resist heat flow which is why it's measured in r value so yeah so definitely more detailing by putting the foam on the outside of the rafter like on the exterior side but it gives you that benefit of a, of a little bit more potential thermal comfort comfort most of new homes that I, I'm seeing being built by contractors will choose to do the foam in the cavity and then blow in the rest. Uh, as seems like maybe that's more cost effective for them than trying to figure out the exterior detailing. So I'm still not sure what, what we're going to do on our house yet, but we'll keep you posted on that. And yeah, I think that's it for now. So I guess one other thing I just wanted to mention really quick, I'm going to flip the camera. Okay, so one other thing I just wanted to mention. So a lot of building practices are dependent on your area and what kind of situations you have. Like we live in a drier climate. There's areas of the country that are more hot and humid and marine climates and cold. So how you build up your wall system will vary slightly depending on where you are. And so here, generally, you want the wall to be able to be some degree of vapor permeable. So if any moisture or air vapor gets into the cavity, that it can dry to either to the outside or the inside or to both. So you want to make sure that your wall can um can breathe let's call it that so we don't want our we don't necessarily want our houses to breathe air like from an air air movement perspective but vapor is is very you know it's more about the perme permeability of a like what you call like an air barrier or vapor barrier so it kind of gets into detailed building science i'm not going to get into all that right now but just know that Generally, walls and ceilings should have some degree of vapor permeability to enable any potential trapped moisture from building materials. Like a lot of the wood is can be wet or it can be out exposed when it's raining. So enabling that to dry out. And also it's good to do a moisture test before you 
close up your walls with drywall or whatever interior finish you're going to do. So, okay, that's it for now, and we will see you soon. Okay.